The Hispanic Educational Technology Service Consortium has distinguished itself as a forefront organization in the integration of technology for the advancements of higher education and learning opportunities for the Hispanic community. Moreover, the HEADS Consortium has elevated collaboration to a new rank, bringing together higher education institutions from the United States, Puerto Rico, and representatives from the government, private, and academic sectors for the past 30 years. These sectors will be represented in this, the 2023 HEADS Best Practices Showcase, validating the importance of collaboration for the success of the Hispanic students in our community. Today, distinguished speaker will discuss the state of, of access to higher education opportunities for students, focusing on important tools like the micro credentials and open badges, which can help dealing with the current challenges of reduced enrollment, barriers to student access, and increased dropout rates. Discussions will focus on how these tools can benefit institutions and students, sharing experiences, and the Inter-American Development Bank in the adaptation of open badges will be one of the highlights. The HES Consortium is proud to open the This Best Practices Showcase with speaker Dr. Stella Porto, Senior Learning Specialist at the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB, in Washington, D.C. Dr. Porto has been with the Inter-American Development Bank since September 2014. The IDB, through its knowledge and learning division, offers a variety of learning products to the Latin American and Caribbean regions. Dr. Porto manages the design, development, and delivery of several of these learning products. Prior to the Inter-American Development Bank, Dr. Stella Porto was the director of the Master of Distance Education and e-learning at the University of Maryland Global Campus, where she has also held other positions since 2001. Prior to that, she was a professor of computer science for around nine years in her native country, Brazil. Stella holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and master's and doctoral degrees in computer science. And much late, later, she added a master's in distant education. Outside of her full-time job duties, she is a facilitator and part of the Quality Matters Research colleague team, member of the Board of Directors of the International Board of Standards for Training, Performance, and Instruction, and part of the editorial board of the American Journal of the Distant Education. Dr. Porto also works on various consulting projects related to online learning through her own business, Stellar J Consultant. Please help me welcome Dr. Stella Porto with a round of applause. Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay, like this? Okay, wonderful. So let me get my clicker. So I decided to um, deal with the issue of access and retention from a perspective of what can we do in terms of curriculum and offering for students. So that's the focus of the presentation today. I will start with some, with some uh, highlights of issues of retention. And a little bit before that, although I had a very long introduction, so I'm not gonna repeat any of that, so I'll skip all of it. Um, but I think it's worth noting that I connect with the area that I'm gonna talk about today because I'm a career changer. And I, I believe that many of you are. So when we start going through our lives, we, we might have these long you know, uh, years of, of that with big diplomas and down the road, we need to continue learning and things happen in our lives and we need to acquire new skills. And sometimes these very big diplomas and these many years of dedication can be a problem for that. I will say that when I took my, the, um, thank you for the introduction. When I was, when I did my master's in distance education, that is much later with two kids, which is very common in many of our students, it took me seven years right? That can't even compare with the big diplomas that I had before. So we need to think of those things when we are preparing to offer new programs for our students. So that's why I have that big bright star there because that was a big change in my life. And it took a big turn. And today, many people do not even know that I'm an electrical engineer, that I was a hardware designer. It doesn't matter. Not that it doesn't matter for me. It still builds into what I am today, but it doesn't matter to other people. I want to portray myself in a different light. 
So let me, something that was not part of my introduction, not fully, I wanna just say what we are doing, uh, what I do in the bank today and where we are growing today, which is the focus also of this presentation. So yes, our unit is focused in developing online courses, mostly associated to the different sectors of the development bank, which could be climate change, health, education. But we have been, uh, we started an initiative in 2018 that has really taken a size that I could not imagine that we would achieve in, in such a short period of time. And that is what we call credenciales bid. No? So this is a very, very large open badge initiative. And I will describe this initiative and some of the things that we have done so far. But I wanna start first looking at the issues. This is the agenda for today. So starting to look at issues of the challenges in terms of access. Most of you probably have your own stats from your institutions, but I wanna recover those, right? We're in the middle of this sort of recovery. We're not out of the pandemic. You know, the government's still saying, we're not gonna put money there, but don't forget, it's not over. Uh, so it's this weird place. Uh, so these have real effects in real lives of our students. So they are, we kind of look at graphs and numbers, but we have to understand that these are lives. And some of these, some of this impact can be forever in, in some people's lives. Then I really want to connect that with, with some trends that none of them are new. I'm going to list them and talk about them, but none of them are new. We the feeling I have, and maybe you agree with me, is that the pandemic was an accelerator, it was just this accelerator to many trends that you already knew. It felt like, oh, I can see them at a distance. And suddenly it's like a tsunami that has just hit us. And we have to react. We can't say, oh, maybe next year we'll put that, right? For a committee to, to decide, we have to do something right now. So I think it's, it's interesting to connect these trends, how they one reinforces the other, and, and then I jump into the area that I love, which is to talk mostly actually the open badges part, but I will go through micro-credentials because I know most people here are from universities and that's the language university uses for the smaller things, but I wanna make some distinctions there. And finally, I will tell you a little bit of what, what, about what we have done. So first looking at the, at the impact um, of the pandemic. So one thing that happened right in the beginning is that people that plan to go to the university canceled it. So there was a lot of, you can, you can look at like 29% of households that had someone thinking of going to the university, canceling their plans right there, right? It hit us right in the beginning, sort of in my home, it hit us in the spring break of my two, uh, my two children. Um, and these problems were much worse for minorities and low-income uh, low low students because they were the ones who the parent maybe was sick from COVID, they had to go home, they had to find a job because their mom didn't have a job at that time. And that is just a much heavier load to carry. Some other students, and this is one of the examples of Jorge Alvarez, he was a senior at Rutger uh, in biological science, if I can remember from where I read the, the, these news. And he, what he was doing is that he had loans, he had things to pay, he was making ends meet with uh, uh, working part-time in the university and all of that kind of disappeared. So starting to sell things on Facebook, you know, making ends meet. He was able to continue studying, but that was not the case of Guillermina. She had to quit. She had to go home, take care of her mom, and a full year out of school. And this kid, Guillermina, she already had doubts about school. That's the other thing. It doesn't mean that we are just saying to you, oh, just wait a year. These are people that have doubts that don't know exactly if they're in the right place. They already have uh, psychological issues, mental health issues that just get worsened with these situations. So it's really a heavy load. And I like always to remember that in the end, we're gonna look at a lot of graphs here, but in the end, that graph 
is a bunch of lives, right? And for each of one of these people, it's just one, not that whole number is meaningful, but just one, it's their life. And so institutions had to adapt very quickly. In most of the uh, presentations where I were during these past uh, three years, a lot of the focus was over things that happened in the classroom, right? We became Zoom, 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 right? I mean, this company, you know, I, I don't know if you bought stocks, but, you know, we have those box stocks before. Um, but we became Zoom classrooms. I can go a whole way about speaking how we should not teach that way, right? Actually, Carlos knows that. Um, I talk a lot about that with him. Uh, we shouldn't teach that way. It's not about making speeches on Zoom, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. There are a lot of things that institutions need to be doing that are not related just particularly to in the classroom because a lot of what sustains our, our, our students in the classroom are things that happen outside the classroom. And so institutions had to adapt that to, to do that too, to provide programs that, for example, support financially students so they continue on coming back to school. And so that's the kind of stuff that I'm looking at today. So first, I have here some stats just to show you, this is the canceling, the plans that were canceled, right? So the overall is right the first column, and you can see immediately how minority students, right, are the ones that suffer the most. These are numbers that show that already Black students, Hispanics, already show that they were the ones to start canceling. Why? You're in a home that already has some issues. You don't have a parent that went to college. You're the first one. You don't know if you belong there. Well, that's the immediate thing you're going to do. You're going to cancel that. So you can see, and then this graph is very interesting because it shows all the different variations. So if you go towards the right, you will see that then you start seeing issues where there was unemployment or you didn't have, you were using SNAP. So that just shows that all these elements of your financial situation were the ones that were heavy on, on such decisions. Then this is data that talks about persistence and retention, right? And also related to race and ethnicity. And what it shows, and, and, and the difference in color here is that the orange part is people that came back, so persistence there, um, to other institutions. So they, they went to some, somewhere else. And then the green part is the one that returned to the same institution. And again, we can see very clearly that you have Latinx, Latinx students showing also issues of who, less people that return, so lower persistence, and also Black students with lower persistence. Again, the same trend. And here's another important point for the institution side. Obviously, community colleges were the ones that showed the steepest decline. Why? because they are the bread and butter of these students that are from minority homes. That's our mission, right? In community colleges. Uh, and obviously they were the ones with the steepest decline, although they are not the ones that charge the most. It doesn't matter in, in this kind of situation. Then another, another uh, uh, and this is looking overall. So from 2020 to 2022, looking at different sectors and how the different institutions uh, um, performed. So this is, and, and, and mind you, this goes all the way to spring 2022. Actually in the fall of 2022, you do see a recovery across the board, although not a recovery that puts you back of where you were in 2019, that's still on our plates, uh, but yes, showing some recovery. But this already shows where the, the, the loss was the greatest. And again, here very well represented um, the public two-year schools. Actually, associate degrees were the ones that suffered the most in terms of enrollments. Again, connecting all these things with students' lives. And if you have associate degrees being 
uh, the ones that lose the, the, the most of the students, you don't have that even that feeder, right? For institutions like my own, the, uh, my, my previous uh, job, I have to remember, um, that we were major in terms of transfer of students from community colleges where they got their associate degrees and then came to a four year public institution. So, you know, I don't wanna be gloomy. That's why I'm saying things have gotten better, but we do have to start thinking in other ways. So connecting then with the trends that I mentioned are accelerated. First demographic, and here I'm gonna pull it to my side, right? We are living longer. We are living longer and working longer. I wanna work longer. I totally wanna work longer. And we want to have places and we want to continue reskilling, upskilling, right? Continue on learning. Lifelong learning is not this little word that you have to explain to people what it means. Everybody knows what it means, right? We go to edX and we are studying not only for professional advancement. Yes, professional advancement is important, but personal growth is really important. It is about living better lives. And learning is part of living a better life, not necessarily because I am gonna get another job or another position, or even professionally, you just wanna be happier. And learning something interesting makes people happy. We should, we should talk about being happy about learning. And the future of work is changing, right? We are talking about different skills. Digital transformation, I am sure, I'm, I don't have chat GPT here on my slides, but everyone is following the news, right? So it is here, it is here. So there is no job that is gonna say, oh, I don't need to learn these skills related to digital transformation. There is no job, there is none. There is, and, and us being from other generations, yes, I come from electric and engineering. So yeah, I have a leg up with everything technology, but there is no age now that you're gonna say, oh, I don't need to learn that because you know I, I will keep on doing my thing. No, if you wanna be within your society, talking to your grandchildren and being part of the world, you need to step in and not be afraid and we need to build things that help these people. We need to think of this, this, this variety of people out there. So reskilling, upskilling, career changes, as I mentioned before, we are changing careers constantly. People don't even know what we were before. Um, cost of higher education really being questioned. It was already being questioned before the pandemic, but now it's real crisis. Why? Because we went, many of us, through two years of Zoom classes, Zoom classes, and we didn't learn many, did not learn how to how to use technology and just went to replicate what we were doing face-to-face -face in an online environment, thinking that in a two-dimensional screen, we're going to be able to show all our personality and then even demand that students have their cameras on because I need to check if you're looking at me. Do not close your eyes. Um, then open, open, open was a big hit for many years, it still is, but it's not quite the solution of everything, right? So open content as if you put content out there, yeah, you learned, just I'll give it to you. No, content is not the king. No, 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 no. So open has to be revisited. You can put content out there. You can put um, learning objects. That's a very uh, um, old word. People don't use it anymore. It was the same thing as all the open content. And that's not the solution. So alternative, and actually the alternative part of alternative credentials is not great because alternative means like it's a lesser thing. It's not supposed to be a lesser thing. Let's say various types of credentials, they are important. Recognition, recognition. And I wanna, if you leave this room today without remembering anything, start thinking of a new kind of open, which is called open recognition. 
It's not part of our, of our way of speaking. But how do we recognize people? We don't recognize people because they have a diploma. People within our community of professionals, which is the thing that is important to us, we are recognized by our community through other kinds of recognition. Sometimes they're not formal, but they can be formalized if a structure for open recognition is really open. So keep that in mind. That's not micro-credentials, but we will talk about micro-credentials anyway. All right, so trend. So jumping to micro-credentials, that is the word that most people in higher education are using when they start thinking of different kinds of credentials. And for the most part, what they wanna do is take whatever course that lasted, I don't know, a full semester, offer it in two weeks for maybe two thirds of the price and it's a little chunk. Micro-credentials is not that and should not be built that way. We need to have some rethinking and, and even a decision to find out if this is a strategy that we want to adopt before we just step into it. So with some definitions. So micro-credentials uh, can be macro-credentials, which would be the ones that are the big ones. You, we all know them are the degrees, the diplomas. Sometimes large certificates are also ma macro credentials, cannot be seen in micro. So they demand a lot of formal education, a lot of formal assessment, right? And also is usually given by uh, higher ed institutions or some relationship with a higher ed institutions, at least through an accrediting uh, uh, body. And micro-credentials uh, are typically focused on a more, a smaller set of learning outcomes. Maybe, you know, two competencies or a couple of skills. So it needs to be seen as smaller, not also in time, but in time be be because it is focused on a small number of competencies. And it's very clear what the outcome is. I think, in the case of micro-credentials, you, uh, you have to be even more um, strict with the issue of outcome because it's a small nugget there in this whole set. So um, uh, talking about volume, we're talking about smaller, more targeted in terms of skills and the topics that you're gonna study. So you're forget about throwing the, the, the kitchen sink in, 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 <laughs> into people. You have to really have your learning objectives very well written and aligned with learning activities, aligned with assessments, and that you can show the outcome very specifically, mostly into industry-focused competencies. And obviously connected to that, which is very connected to, the, to this conference, more flexible in terms of delivery, right? So online is a great match to do this. And who is doing this? Who is offering micro-credentials? So yes, many universities, you will find many universities offering it. Actually, one of the interesting things that um, is happening mostly in Europe are governments, not that they're offering, but governments creating large frameworks that will support institutions to develop their micro-credentials. And those frameworks are important because of the challenges that we have with this kind of, of, uh, of initiative. And why are people taking and, and, and interested in this? There is the whole thing about the questioning of the cost. People are doing for educational advancement. Sometimes before going to the university, you want to kind of get ahead. So you might get do smaller things. There you are. You have a market right there, right? Look at high school students offer their something. In a way, we are doing this when we have students in high school doing already things for college. But you can do things outside of that realm, not necessarily through the school. Um, and then thinking of employers, alignment with employers. This is where recognition again comes into play. More and more, many industries are opening their eyes and saying, 
you know, when I put out the, that job description, I used to say that I need a bachelor's degree of whatever. And I tell you, I come from a large organization and it's this thing. It's like you have a, you're tied, right? You have to put a bachelor's degree of, because we don't have other ways of recognizing people. It's hard. It's hard to assess people. And, and actually the, the challenge is the issue of assessment. And we believe that that bachelor's degree, the, the, that four years is the right assessment that we need to hire people. And in fact, it isn't in many cases. So many industries, what they are doing is that they're developing their own ways to measure people and to really have those people, filter those people in. And one of the skills that they want is not just, you know, doing your stuff on the job, it's soft skills that are very, very hard to measure. Again, open recognition and open recognition of small things. Coming on time every time is something that you should be able to showcase. It means a lot for someone who's going to hire you. So what are the, the general characteristics that we're looking for when we're thinking of micro-credentials? So it's a bunch of them I, I, I mentioned already. You know, I would focus on learning outcomes, very, very specific, uh, um, targeted, uh, what you're going to assess. Maybe you have some external assurance, right? Maybe other organizations that say, hey, I really want that. So they're the alignment between uh, educational providers and industry. Portable, um, so it can be recognized in other places. Portable also in terms of being digital and being portable. We're going to get to that in my perfect topic, which is open badges. Um, if you can, and that's the real thing about um, micro-credentials, that you can get credit. Unfortunately, we're still tied to that system. We all want to get out of that system, but it is there. And even who's not in that system, I tell because we're not, the bank is not in that system, but we look at that system and we say, oh, if our courses could get credits, right? It opens up all these doors because it still means the path to advancement in formal education, which also will continue to be recognized. So located within a national framework, if there is one, um, employer role. So maybe you have an industry that also is aligned with those. So let's talk about project management, for example. You have PMI saying, yeah, this is good, right? Um, uh, you have some, something associated to information about wage or occupation, Me, you can tell that when you get out of this, this is the kind of job you can do, and that means this much money. Um, and again, going to the technology part, if the person is the owner of this recognition and can take them. This in my world where we're talking about Latin America and the Caribbean, being able to immigrate to another country and carry that with you. Very, very important. Okay. So who's doing that? Mentioned, I, uh, I mentioned most educational institutions, public, private, uh, private companies. We have, you know, the, the whole movement of MOOCs has a actually opened up a, a lot of big, big doors for that. So if you go into uh, EDX, you'll find, you know, institutions offering large certificates as an entryway to their program. So, so that is a big, uh, big provider. Um, and the ways we're delivering it, a lot of it fully online, but it does not have to be online, right? Micro-credentials, they, they say nothing. When you define micro-credentials, you say nothing about technology, nothing. It is about curriculum. It is about learning outcomes, not about technology. Uh, you can offer it in blended, you can offer it on campus. The online part is not a prerequisite to talk about micro-credentials. So if there's all that, why haven't everyone jumped into this? And I go back to a comment that I made before, there is a lack of consistency, right? So I am, I'm speaking one language, someone else is speaking another language, and 
So how is this going to be accepted if that other place doesn't recognize that as that? And that's why the credit system is still that they're so powerful, right? But there are policies that can change that. So there is a lack of common agreement. First, the definition. If you Google micro-credentials, you're gonna find a bunch of definitions. One of them, the one I hate the most, is that they say micro-credentials is the same as open badges. It is not, it is not. Lack of agreement, how they integrate with what is already there, right? So you're not gonna throw away the, the baby with the bathwater, you know, you're, degrees are gonna still be there and attract people. And actually what we need to look into is to create gateways, right? To get to those degrees or, or make them faster in a way, or I can take it, you know, in small drops and not in, in full four years. So it will require a lot of articulation between policymakers, institutions, uh, maybe national, maybe like in Europe, international, where you really start even defining careers and jobs, which is, it can be a forever job since it's changing every day, but there's something there to be done. So I step back a little bit before I go into the, to the open badges part, just so we have everything in place. So the world of credentials, I can talk about credentials in a general way, and I can talk about digital credentials. Not all credentials are digital. It's fine. Although they should start becoming digital, never forgetting that they should become paper if you want to or not, because a lot of the world still depends on paper. So don't forget about that. People move for different reasons. So then to start separating things, there's the world of micro-credentials and there's digital credentials. Not all micro-credentials are digital. You could be giving your micro-credentials and handing in, handing a piece of paper. You should be moving from, away from that, but it's still there. And then there's digital badges, okay? Digital badges is a, a kind of digital credential. And then there's open badges. Open badges is one particular one and the one you should look into. Make sure that when you go into a badging initiative, you are going either with a provider or doing it yourself because you can you are following open badge standard because it's an open standard. And so what is, so the digital badge, I skipped a little bit there, but the digital badge, the difference between a digital badge and a digital credential that is not a digital badge is that a digital badge has an image, an image and data, and they're together, okay? So open badges, because it's a digital badge, it also has that characteristic. It has the, the image and you have this metadata and we call it metadata because the data has an explanation about what it is. And that's very important. That's why we call it a specification because I know every piece of data that is behind the image has a meaning has a meaning that is open and understood. And therefore I can put it wherever on the web. That's the, the power of it. So make sure because there are providers that they might say that they're following the specification, but you need to ensure that this is going forward like that because they might be okay now, but they need to be following the specification as it evolves. And it, it is evolving as we speak. So, the data inside a badge is some of those fields there that I mentioned. So it has information about the badge name. It has the criteria that was used to assess someone that earned it. It has the information of the issuer. It has the issue date, recipient, a bunch of things, right? And this is growing. Actually, now you can have endorsements. You can have alignment with frameworks. There's a bunch of things that you can have that are part of that data. And the beauty of, of open badges is that this data is baked into the image. So if you have ever shared a, an open badge on LinkedIn and you say, why do I click on this? I just upload this image. 
uh, PNG or whatever it is, and people can go somewhere because the information is baked in there into the image when the badge is issued. So we're talking about something that is transferable, right? Because it follows that open specification, so it can it can go places on the internet. It is stackable because it has uh, features that it can connect to other badges, so you can see how it connects and then build beautiful learning pathways. Um, you you are talking about evidence. So in many cases, depending on the way you issue the badge, you might actually have the evidence that is associated to the criteria used to assess someone to earn that badge. That evidence is pegged there also to the badge. And after the badge is, trans is, is issued to someone, that person owns it. Nobody can change it. Even if you change the badge itself in the little badge factory you might have, the badge that was issued will not change. It will not change. It was issued already. It, that person owns it. So what I was saying is kind of explaining this life cycle there of the badge, right? So issuers like a university, like the IDB, they will create what you call badge classes. And hey, just a parenthesis here, this is why my computer science degree helps me every day <laughs> because I deal with this techie stuff. Um, so you create batch classes, right, in a platform. You award those, those badges. So you issue those badges. In the moment that you issue a badge, you create what you call an assertion. An assertion is a URL. That's what it is. And that is what the earner owns. It's that assertion that will have all the metadata that is part of the badge class, but will also have the information that I, Stella, earned it on such date, right? And maybe it will have also the evidence that is associated to the process of getting the badge. And then I might want to store that badge in a host, in a in a, you know, sometimes we call backpack. I don't like too much that word because a backpack is closed and I want them open to the world, but I can store them somewhere. And that place will also help me, give me some functions that I help me share this as well. You don't need to have that in order to share, but it does help when you start having lots of badges. And so you host there and that becomes also a display of the badge to whom? Because these badges are important to me, but they're important to me because there's someone that can look at it. There's the recognition part. I will, these badges will be seen by a consumer, by, by the other people, different people. And these people, because it's open badge, again, because it's the follows that standard, they can verify that badge on the spot. They can check if that badge is valid, if that badge is from an issuer that is valid, right? They can see all that metadata. People love to look at the images, but the images is just the envelope. It has really nothing there. The metadata is the important part. And that's where the quality of an open badge is. It's, it's, it's the data that describes why and what was done to earn that badge. So people can then see badges of other people and verify, verify identity of the person and also the other information if it's valid. Actually open badges can have validation. So it's very nice to use for something that you need to revalidate. You can use badges for that. Okay, so types of badges. Badges are just an incredible vessel. And that's where we start seeing the difference between micro-credentials and badges. Badges are, open badges are a technology. It's not, I'm not saying what's in there, right? I'm not saying. Micro-credentials is really talking, if you go to the UNESCO recent report that they had, I think late 2020, um, that they have a definition of micro-credential, it doesn't say anything about technology. Open badges is talking about technology. So types of badges, you can have IBM and they have it, badges that are about the skills. So industries, 
really see this as a gain because they can really say, hey, if you take this, then you're in my hiring pool, okay? And then companies need to also start thinking because for you to attract people to your company, you need to let them know that, you know, you are going to learn new skills here. You're going to be recognized. So you can go on with your career, even leaving this place, because this is the mindset. You want people to advance. You don't want people to stay with you forever if they don't want to. You want people to advance. And that's a mindset also of an, of an industry that understand that they need to be a learning organization. So most badges are really related to knowledge. So you test people, you know, the ones that you just do a course and you're tested to see if you have knowledge, but there are badges of soft skill. Remember, very hard, but you can have things that you are assessing behavior and the behavior is represented. Participation badges, that's the one that I love to talk about because people say, wow, what the heck, a badge for participation? Well, maybe I have 15 badges of having participated in um, cybersecurity conferences. Maybe one badge doesn't mean anything, but when I go to an employer and I have 15 badges of cybersecurity, they're going to look at me and at least say, wow, that girl, she's really interested in this. Okay, interest, curiosity is something I want when I hire people. You have to be ready to learn to come work with me. So there you go. I can measure that with badges of participation. We do a ton of that at the bank. You get people addicted because then you do an event and there's no badge and people are upset. So hold on. I do have a badge for you. Hold on. Identity badges. Badges that actually recognize a community, right? Recognize digitally a community because I want other people to see that I belong to that community and I can have a badge for that. Um, and then certification badges. Yes, just like certificates, you can have a badge with all that, but much more information, much more than that signature of whoever was the dean at that point that then 10 years later they're not there anymore that signature has very little but the metadata has a lot in there if you do it right so where's the value of a badge it is not it is not just one thing there's a lot of components of of the data um and these all these beautiful pictures are from Brian Mathers. You can look him up on all these pictures are creative comments. He's wonderful. He does these things on the fly in front of you. So what is a badge worth? Because that's a lot of the question that comes uh, to people. Well, what is this worth, right? Well, it is a lot of components. First, the value of the issuer, okay? The issuer it's a, it's a heavy weight in the field that is issuing the badge or endorsing because endorsement is also a piece of that. The meaning of the badge, right? Achievement, uh, behavior, what, what are you expressing? So important metadata there. And then the journey, right? Maybe this badge is part of a journey. A lot of badges are stepping stones to other things. I love our provider. He always loves to talk about badges as connectors, right? Badges are connectors. He said, that's why he says, I learned the whole backpack thing with him. Because no, 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 it's, they're connectors, they're connectors. And, and it, it opened doors. You can see badges as opening doors, motivating people, right? And I don't need to jump into gamification. I'm not going there. But motivators in terms of educational advancement. And then very important there at the, end is the viewer because badges have a context. It's not like anybody. If I look at someone that has nothing to do with my field, I can look at a, I can look at anything and I won't understand because I'm not part of that professional community. So it really depends in the viewer, right? And the viewer is the community you belong to. So Open badges can be used to deliver those micro-credentials. Yes, great marriage. They don't have to fight, right? That they're not the same thing, but they don't have to fight. You know, I was in a conference um, in November that they did a whole legal thing 
where he had micro credentials and badges. One had sued the other and just for the, for the fun of it. And in the end, they said, no, you shouldn't be in this court. You're all part of the same family. I love that. So yes, they're part of the same family. They're friends. They have, you know, Sunday lunches, but they're not the same thing. They have their opinions. Um, and using the same words, that's why the same words, like saying, oh, it's the same. Why I don't like it? Because it really diminishes the scope of using badges, right? Micro-credentials has all those pegs to it in terms of curriculum, and badges are this open vessel. But not a panacea, right? So very important. I hear a lot of people questioning, well, but is this badge good? Well, to measure a badge, I need to look at the quality of the metadata. How much does the metadata express the learning experience and the criteria and the assessment? If the assessment is dot, 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 the badge has nothing to do with it, nothing. If the course is bad, the badge is not gonna fix the course. The course is bad, that's it, go fix it. You know, and usually it's assessment because we're all very bad at assessment. It's hard to do good assessment. Very, very hard, authentic assessment. So badges do not improve learning experience. They are for recognition, okay? So if the learning experience is bad, go fix the learning, but make sure that the badge expresses very, very clearly to the earner and to the consumers, to the, to the audience of that earner. That's why thinking of badges is a, a, a conceptual design first. Don't get a provider and start doing things. Think of it first. So finally, I don't know where I am in terms of time because I'm very bad at it. How many minutes do I have? Okay. You forgot too. 10 minutes, great. Oh, five minutes, she's, 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 this is inflation. Okay, I can do it, I can do it in five minutes. Okay, so just very quickly, because this is not the important part, it's just, you know, I have to say where I'm coming from and why, why, I, why I know this and why I breathe this every day. Um, so we started our Credenciales Bid um, initiative in 2018, as I mentioned before. And mostly why we did that was because we're not a, we're not an, an university and we needed some way to recognize. But let me step back a little bit because maybe people don't know what a development bank is and they're saying, what is this woman that is in the bank doing with all this? Well, a development bank, the, the IDB is like the World Bank, which you might have heard more than the IDB because they're larger. Um, the IDB is a multilateral right? It's an organization with several countries. Um, and it has loans and grants and does, you know, uh, things that banks do. So they don't have personal accounts or anything. It's just between countries. And you give money for projects, development projects. So you might have something related to health, something related to education, climate change, uh, transportation, all sorts, ev everything actually that we live in is related to development, like social and economic development. So that's the mission of the bank. But one of the things that the bank really is different than other banks that might give money is because the bank is full of a bunch of economists for the most part, which have big degrees and they study their areas and they produce a lot of research. So one of the things that the bank does besides providing the, the money is really provide expertise and technical assistance when these development projects are done, right? I had to learn all this because I come from university too. So all of this was a surprise. So, but it's a lot of fun, I have to say. So I work in the knowledge area of the bank. And what we do is that we work with the different sectors. So I might be working with someone from, and I am working with someone from transportation and they now have a course on digital transformation in transportation policy. I mean, think about it. If you love learning, I'm in a playground because I move from one course like this to another that talks about health somewhere else. 
and you're dealing with all these things. It's, you learn a lot. So that's what we do, okay? So credentials came to us really because we wanted some way to recognize. And we did certificates. We have been doing certificates, that, that one, that PDF one, and it could be verified with a little number, all that. But it has nothing there. It's just this, right? It's a PDF with a background and, and a title. It might say the number of hours, still the whole seat time, which, uh, anyway. So no information about what you did there, nothing. So I came, you know, I had been at UMUC when I entered the bank and we had just had a little um, flare with uh, competency-based education. I think it was very short because they didn't go with that for, for very long, but I had that and we were already talking about badges, right? And so I, when, I, when I came into the bank, I already kind of had that with me. And I, we st I started talking about it, talking about it. And, and so we entered that in 2018. You know, this is actually a picture of the first workshop we did in 2018, really talking, explaining to people what it was, et cetera. And we first started very, very um, calmly, I would say, giving badges to our courses, right? Just to courses. And we wanted two things with this initiative when we started. One is that, just to give recognition to the learning, which is, it, which is one way of using badges. But we also wanted to be agents of change because of what we do in Latin America and the Caribbean. We are in conversations with policymakers. We are part of projects. So we wanted, with our example, to also change the world of credentialing, to open up people's minds and to maybe start speaking to different public agencies. Hey, you can do this. We can help you. Not only help you teaching you stepping stones, but also you can have your badges here on my platform. I can help you with that in the beginning. And then you can go on your own, right? Giving them technical assistance. And we've been very, very successful at that. We were a very good fit. We are not for credit. You know, all our courses are for professionals. Um, so we didn't have any of these things tying us to, to, to anything. So a lot. So if you go back to your institutions, go look for the low hanging fruits, go look at continuing education, start there. Don't start at the hard stuff, start at the easy stuff. Cause then you learn a lot and you can implement, you know, uh, uh, more, uh, more co comprehensively through the organization. So since 2018, now we have more than 180,000, yes, there are the three zeros there, um, earned, right? More than 600 types of badges, and that includes all a, a large taxonomy. We actually finished, it was very important to us because we got so big to have a framework. So this past year, we developed a framework, right? that puts a lot of consistency throughout the badges. So we have badges there for the courses, we have for applied knowledge, we have uh, competencies, but we are moving. And that's the part that really makes me happy is the whole, what we call flexible recognition are these things that are not courses, that you recognize people for what they show, what, what they have done right? I'm not the one that says, you have to take my course so I can recognize. No, you know this, and maybe I can just recognize you, right? Open recognition. And it doesn't have to be from an organization. It could be a person giving uh, an open badge. And that is not like giving a comment on LinkedIn. Please do not tell me that because a comment on LinkedIn, you don't take it anywhere, and it's not metadata, it's just kudos, right? And probably you asked for it or something, so. So what is behind, and this is really the part that is tacit kind of knowledge here for me. You know, I can now say these things because I've done it, right? If you are thinking of a large uh, badging system, you have to think, and this is not linear, okay? So don't think like I do this and then I'm not a waterfall model here. These are the four things kind of clusters of elements of thinking of a badging system. So you have to think of the system design, 
So the scope, the governance, the governance, please have governance. You don't want people stepping on each other's toes. It doesn't mean that it's not collaborative, but it needs to have governance, right? Who, who says, okay, this is good. Um, policies and related to governance, policies and procedures. You don't have to overload it in the front end, but as you move forward, you will, you will have, as you start getting bigger, you will need to have some policies and procedures that kind of plays with the change management, right? You start in the beginning, maybe with a champion in there, that person has a lot of leeway. And then later on, they don't have all that leeway because you found out that you need some policies and procedures, but that's fine, that's fine. Then, um, and then at that point, you need to start thinking of resources. Do not think that a badging system runs on its own. It does not, it is not a turnkey. It's, you know, MOOCs are, are not turnkey. I always have to say to people, hey, you develop a MOOC, you have to offer it, you have to pay people, okay? Not, not no free lunch. Think of the resources, technology resources, people that understand you have to have different kinds of people or a person that knows all of this some technology, some instructional design, right? Good English or Spanish or whatever language you're using or multiple language like us, we have four languages. We have badges that are multi-language. You have to have someone that is checking the language. Then the badge design. When you're designing a badge, you have to think of that value proposition. Think of the earner. Don't think that you want to give that badge. Who cares if you want to give that badge? The person that earns the badge needs to want that badge and they need to want it for a reason. Um, then as you do that value proposition, think of the image so it's nice. Um, or if you're doing a constellation of badges that some parts of the image will be permanent and some others will change. Some people go into a lot of framework about images. We don't do that because we have, so, you know, I, I work with so many clients in the bank that I can't say, oh, you have to have it round and yellow. No, I just, you know, images, they can do whatever they want, being accessible, but they can do whatever they want. And then I'm, you know, I'm more strict with the metadata. And then start thinking of learning paths, right? Learning paths are important because they make the badges become really these connectors, these, these keys to open. The publishing part is really the techie part of all this, right? You have to be able, but not complicated techie, okay? It's a, if you're going with a provider, you're not, you can build it yourself. Actually Moodle, if you run Moodle, you already have a badging platform because Moodle does work with badges and they're open. Um, but you know, Canvas just bought Badger. I had Badger, but I already migrated Badging Platform. That's how much I suffered. I'm giving you all the, you know, the stepping stones here. I changed providers in the middle of it. Um, so platform, decide which platform. For example, the case of uh, the case of Badger. Badger was not associated with an LMS. That's an integration, right? It doesn't mean that you can't have the Canvas badges, you can, but now it is associated to an LMS. I mean, you have to think about it, right? Um, so platform setup, configuration, there's some front work there that probably your provider can do, but you will have to have someone who can be doing, creating these badges, you know, and understanding some tech stuff. Um, and then integration with other systems, okay? That is very important. So if a corporation is using this associated to their HR, you probably want to see if there's some way of integrating. You can work outside, but it becomes way more manual and way more labor. We have that issue right now. It's not connected to our, a to our HR system. So we are giving badges internally, and that is just work you know, give, send lists of people and things like that. Yes, one minute. Integration, la da da, and the change management. Communication, adoption, expansion, talk to people, start small, do a lot of communication. This is not easy to understand for most people. People get very confused. You have to repeat a lot. Um, so just uh, the, the whole ending of this, it is an opportunity to open learning systems, great potential for unbundling things, but not just cutting up courses, but unbundling things, 
recognition of learning and achievement, build paths to just recognize, not necessarily give a course, just recognize stuff. So you put people in the right path. Um, and this might not be for everyone. So there is a moment here, which is not to jump into things and really go back, maybe reset priorities, see how this fits with the first things you need to do, because it is not something that you just do. Because after you start doing it, you can't just, you know, oh, I won't do this anymore. You have to have a long-term plan. So here's your badge. Get your phones out. Also, who, who, the, those on Zoom, your phone's out. There's actually a link. Uh, I don't have the computer, so I can't put it on the chat, in the chat. So you should get a form. This form, you should put your name. Did you get the form? Is it all working? Oh, great. Can you imagine if I had this didn't work? Oh, God. Um, so put your name in because that's going to be on your, on your badge. And, um, and then there's this little code and that's important, whatever the little, you know, I'm not a robot thing that shows up for you because that's a security thing. Give your email because your identity is your email. And when you, if you want, you could go to our platform the Credenciales Bid platform, create an account. And you don't have to because you will receive your badge into your inbox. But if you want after that, when you get, you know, get the badge in your inbox, did anyone get the badge already? Yay. You can actually open an account and see our, what we call Credenciales Bid passport. And that's, we don't call backpack. We call it passport because actually it's a platform that you can see other people. You can see, you might actually find your colleagues that have earned this badge and you can see other badges. So it has this social aspect to it. And that's all I had. Thank you so much. I actually didn't say thank you in the beginning for the invitation. So yes, Carlos, you're back. Thank you. Questions, okay. yes, questions. I was leaving. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you can't leave. Uh, I'm, I'm having here my computer with the chat open. So any question from the virtual participants, I will be reading those questions to uh, Stella, but we can start. We have microphones on the side. So if we have any questions in the meantime, uh, uh, people, uh, okay. Okay, uh, Jessica Munoz just said I was able to send uh, the application. Thank you. So, uh, any questions from the podium? I mean, from the from the floor, please. I see Paul. Are you going or uh, to do a question or? Ah, okay, you're going outside. Oh, okay. So, any questions? This is the time. Ah, okay, Thomas. If you can please, since we are recording, if you can go to that microphone over there, it will be great. Oh, is someone? Bueno, es que no. I have a cable. Okay. No, 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 no it's a microphone. Ah, un wireless. Ah, okay. Ah, pues mira. Too late. Oh, sorry. Okay, so sorry. So you can stretch out. So as a president of a... Uh... State University uh, that has faculty unions and and a faculty senate and yeah. and you know uh, that govern curriculum and all those channels. I was pleased for you. You know, you mentioned earlier. Well, you know, use continuing ed, but we do have a college of extended learning that does not is not adhered to um, all of those bureau bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, obstacles to badges. Right. <clears throat> Have you seen any universities like the one I just described um, use badges to as part of their educational delivery? Yes, always with micro credentials. Uh, meaning, meaning they use open badges to deliver micro credentials. Right. So not so much the other kinds of badges that I talked about. 
but a lot of badges that simply are the vessel for a micro-credential, which is part of their curriculum. Yes, that is, that is actually the most common case at, at universities. But let me, get, let me say something. You can also think of badges, not necessarily for your students, but for your staff, for your faculty. And that is a huge motivator. So again, badges are more than just saying, come to, to the degree. No, we have to think of learning wider, right? Leadership skills at the university. You know, a lot, actually I have a, I have a presentation that I didn't do here, which I have badges that I issued for myself, which I would love to have them being issued by my employers. They weren't, but I would love my online education competencies, my badging competencies. So I think it's really a paradigm shift, right? That's why change management is so important there. And my recommendation of starting with, you know, either general studies or continuing ed is that you can experiment, right? And then as you get the hang of it and you start, things start to change because they will, um, you're ready. We have another question from the floor. Is, can you, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so uh, my observation um, is that um, it's uh, not that straightforward to incorporate badges into the academic process of a university. Uh, because what I find and what we have found is that um, the material that is normally included as what we actually refer to as industry recognized credentials is part of different courses. Oftentimes you don't find it in one course. The student has to take two or three different courses to get all the material corresponding to that industry recognized credential. So it becomes a little bit more difficult for students to just go and take a specific training. Uh, they normally have to do it over a period of semesters. And that's the part that I think is complicated now. So what we do have is uh, in the case of San Bernardino, as uh, Professor Morales was talking about, we have a different division that does non-credit training. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we are incorporating the badges and the uh, industry recognized credentials. And that's where we work with industry and business to make sure that we understand what is it that their needs are. But you could have several, could, could you have several badges that represent that bigger thing recognized? Because you, you don't have to think of one badge doing the whole thing. And let me give you just one situation. Let's say you have a student that, let's say you can map your course to various badges, that those, the totality of these badges actually represent that certification that you're talking about, if I got it right. If I drop your class because something happened to me, I might have two of those badges. Maybe I don't have them all, but I have two of them. And this might allow me to maybe later on not have to do all the assessments all over again. So that's where I connect with access and retention right in the beginning, is that when we start thinking of these smaller granularities, we are creating these various paths for access. We are just helping people. Maybe they don't have to do this all over again. Just a thought. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Please don't go. Please don't go. Uh, we don't have uh, time for more questions, but uh, Albert, if you could bring, bring me something as a token of up. Okay, please don't let them go. As a token of appreciation to Stella Thank for you. coming to Puerto Rico yeah. and give us this excellent presentation. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, we will pass to our MC, uh, Albert, Dr. Albert Troche, to conclude this opening session. And thank you to all. Go ahead. Okay. So, with this open plenary, we officially open the 2023 Heads Best Practices Showcase inaugural event. You are cordially invited to attend our breakout sessions presentations room are identified in your program. 
Before we conclude this session, we would like to provide you with some important news and instructions. There is a simultaneous translation available for the Spanish presentations. Headsets are available at the auditorium lobby. For the participants connected virtually, an icon of interpretation will be at the bottom of the virtual room to select the language of, our, of your reference. For the English presentations to closed captions, features is available. All presentations are being recorded and will be uploaded at the HEADS website during the following weeks. An email will be sent to all participants to invite you to visit HEADS.org to access all those videos and share it among your colleagues. Participants in person have the opportunity to complete a form at the registration area to receive a continuing education certificate for this event with a contact hours per day or both days for a fee of $15 or $20 respectively any time to facilitate the access to all presentations, launches, and the coffee station available throughout the concurrent quest sessions. At the registration area, you will find additional information for any further questions or doubts regarding this event. Finally, thank you all for accepting HEADS invitation to participate in the 2023 Best Practices Showcase. We hope you can benefit tremendously for all the resources and networking opportunities available for you during this conference. We will now have a 10 minute to visit a coffee stations at the building square or Plaza Oleta area. And at 1040 AM, all break stations will begin at their respective rooms. You will have 10 minutes break between the concurrent sessions to move to the locations of the sessions of your ref preference and to visit the coffee station. Once again, gracias, thank you and enjoy the conference.